clearly in, in the back? Good. If there's any problem, just wave your hand. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here at the University of Wisconsin to speak this evening. I'd like to thank Steve Horn for inviting me and the Student Progressive Dane, the Middle Eastern Law Student Association, and all the other organizations that are sponsoring my visit. I especially appreciate all of you for coming out to hear me speak. <clears throat> My topic is Greater Israel's Bleak Future. When I use the term Greater Israel, I'm referring to the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, or what was long ago called Mandatory Palestine. As you all know, the land that land is now broken into two parts, Israel proper, or what is sometimes called Green Line Israel, and the occupied territories, which include the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The first part of my talk tonight is about the future relationship between Israel and the occupied territories. Of course, I'm not just talking about the fate of those lands, I'm also talking about the future of the people who live there. I'm talking about the future of the Jews and the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, as well as the Palestinians who live in the occupied territories. The story I will tell is straightforward. Contrary to the wishes of the Obama administration and most Americans, to include many American Jews, Israel is not going to allow the Palestinians to have a viable state of their own. Regrettably, the two-state solution is now a fantasy. Instead, those territories will be incorporated into a greater Israel, which will be an apartheid state, bearing a marked resemblance to white-ruled South Africa. The second part of my talk focuses on the longer-term viability of greater Israel, and in particular, how the American Jewish community will relate to it. I believe that a Jewish apartheid state is not politically viable over the long term, and although some American Jews will defend Israel no matter what, support for Israel and the broader community will diminish over time. In the end, Greater Israel will become a democratic binational state whose politics will be dominated by its Palestinian citizens. In other words, it will cease being a Jewish state which will mean the end of the Zionist dream. Let me explain how I reach these conclusions. Given present circumstances, Israel faces four possible futures with regard to its relationship with the Palestinians. The outcome gets the most attention these days, certainly here in the United States, is the two-state solution, which was described in broad outline by President Bill Clinton in late December 2000 at the White House, and which President Obama has been vigorously promoting since he took office in January 2009. It would obviously involve creating a Palestinian state living side by side with Israel. To be viable, that Palestinian state would have to control 95% or more of the West Bank and all of Gaza. In addition, there would have to be territorial swaps to compensate the Palestinians for the small pieces of West Bank territory that Israel was allowed to keep in the final agreement. East Jerusalem would be the capital of the Palestinian state. The Clinton parameters envisioned certain restrictions on that new state's military capabilities, but it would control the water underneath it the airspace above it, and its own borders, to include the Jordan River Valley. There are three possible alternatives to a two-state solution, all of which involve creating a greater Israel, which again is an Israel that controls Gaza and all of the West Bank. In the first scenario, greater Israel would become a democratic binational state in which Palestinians and Jews enjoy equal political rights. This solution has been suggested by a handful of Jews and a growing number of Palestinians. 
However, it would, mean, it would mean abandoning the original Zionist vision of a Jewish state, since the Palestinians would eventually outnumber the Jews in greater Israel. Second, Israel could expel most of the Palestinians from greater Israel, thereby preserving its Jewish character through an overt act of ethnic cleansing. This is what happened in 1948 when the Zionists drove roughly 700,000 Palestinians out of the territory that became the new state of Israel. Following the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel expelled between 100,000 and 260,000 Palestinians from the newly conquered West Bank and drove 80,000 Syrians from the Golan Heights. The scale of the expulsion, however, would have to be even greater this time because there are about 5.5 million Palestinians living between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. The final alternative to a two-state solution is some form of apartheid, whereby Israel increases its control over the occupied territories but allows the Palestinians to exercise limited autonomy in a set of disconnected and economically crippled enclaves. It seems clear to me, and I want to be very clear about this, that the two-state solution is the best of these alternative futures. This is not to say that it's an ideal solution, because it is not but it is by far the best outcome for Israel and the Palestinians, as well as the United States. And of course, this is why President Obama is so committed to pushing it. Nevertheless, the Palestinians are not going to get their own state anytime soon. Instead, they're going to end up living in an apartheid state <laughs> dominated by Israeli Jews. The main reason that a two-state solution is no longer a serious option is that most Israelis are opposed to making the sacrifices that would be necessary to create a viable Palestinian state. And there is little reason to expect, to expect an epiphany on these issues. For starters, there are now about 480,000 settlers in the occupied territories and a huge infrastructure of connector and bypass roads, not to mention settlements. Much of that infrastructure and large numbers of those settlers would have to be removed to create a Palestinian state. Many of those settlers, however, would fiercely resist any attempt to roll back the settlement enterprise. A Hebrew University poll conducted this past March found that 21%, that's roughly one-fifth of the settlers, say that, quote, if the government decides on a comprehensive evacuation of settlements in the West Bank, they will resist it by all means. That would obviously include the use of arms. In addition, the study found that 54% of those 480,000 settlers do not recognize the government's authority to evacuate the West Bank settlements. And even if there was a referendum sanctioning a withdrawal, 36% of the settlers said they would not accept it. Those settlers, however, do not have to worry about the present government trying to remove them. Prime Minister Netanyahu is committed to expanding the settlements in East Jerusalem and indeed throughout the West Bank. Of course, he and virtually everyone in his cabinet are opposed to giving the Palestinians a viable state of their own. Larry Durfner, a columnist for the Jerusalem Post, recently summed up Netanyahu's thinking about these matters in a recent column. Quote, for him to divide the land, to divide Jerusalem, to give up Hebron, to send 100,000 settlers packing, that would be treason in his eyes. That would be moral suicide. His heart isn't in it. Everything in him rebels at the idea. 
our prime minister is constitutionally incapable of leading the nation out of the Palestinians' midst, of fighting the settlers and the right in a virtual or literal civil war, of persuading Israelis to admit that on the crucial endeavor of their national life for the past 43 years, they were wrong and the world was right. One might argue that there are prominent Israelis, like former Foreign Minister Zippy Livni and former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, who openly disagree with Netanyahu and advocate a two-state solution. While this is true, it is by no means clear that either of them would be willing or able to make the concessions that would be necessary to create a legitimate Palestinian state. Certainly, Olmert <coughs> did not do so when he was prime minister. But even if they were, it is unlikely that either of those leaders, or anyone else for that matter, could get enough of their fellow citizens to back an effective two-state solution. The political center of gravity in Israel has shifted sharply to the right over the past decade, and there is no sizable pro-peace party or movement that they could turn to for help. Probably the best 